Today is August the 6th, 2014. My name is Tanya Pincham along with Juliana Nicolasian. We're with Oklahoma State University and today we're in Gaiman, Oklahoma to speak with Kathy Boyd regarding the Herd Farm. Yes. Centennial Farm and this is part of our Oklahoma Farm Centennial Farm Family Project. So thank you for having us today. Well thank you for coming. It's an honor to be included on this. Let's start with having you tell us how the land came to be in your family to begin with and then we'll just proceed from there. Well, my grandfather, Oscar Neal Hurd, he went by O.N., was um, an employee at the Florida Lumber Company and uh, the Florida Lumber Company established sawmills up and down the Mississippi River and my grandfather went in, once they got one established, got it up and running and then they would move him to another one. Um, at the age of 41, in 1903, he was told he had malaria and he was told he only had six months to live if he did not get to a drier climate. And he had heard about no man's land, so he came out and checked it out. And he wrote Grandma a letter, and in that letter he said, there's no mosquitoes, it's cool at night, and I can see the stars and it never rains. So he thought he'd found God's country. Um, he fi went in, filled out the papers to file on the claim, and went back to Tennessee to finish up business there. And when he came back then to build his shack, he found out there had been a mistake in the filing. They had actually filed him on Section 3414, and it was supposed to be Section 4414. So he had to start the process again. And they filled out the new papers. He built a shack, 10 by 12, 10 by 20, something like that. Had a cot and a stove, and that was about it in it. Stayed for six months. He, a neighbor, Mr. Williamson, did come and break out 20 acres for him. And he started planting mainly fruits and vegetables and stuff. They had to show that they were making improvements on the land. He had to be here six months, and then he could leave for six months. So he stayed six months, went back to Tennessee, and did work. During that time that he was here homesteading, uh, one of my cousins had sent information that Grandpa had offer after offer after offer from the lumber company to come back to work for him. They just kept doubling his salary and doubling his salary and doubling his salary. So when he'd go back those six months periods, he would work for them and make some more money and so he could come back. Anyway, in 1905, he uh, chose to bring grandma and their two daughters out. But before they came, he got a letter that from the neighbor that his shack had been stolen. And you know, if you think about it, there was no foundations, no plumbing, nothing. So they'd go in, they'd jack it up, put it on a sled, and take it off and live in it somewhere else. So Grandpa came back and dug a half dugout. Grandma didn't want to leave, live totally in the ground. So he dug a half dugout and built two rooms on top of the ground. And. Uh, then they came in 1905, later in the year, he brought Grandma and the girls back. Um, we do have some, a picture of the dugout that I think you probably want to take later. And what was the, the wife's name and the daughter's Min, name? Okay, Minnie Reed was her maiden name. Minnie Reed Heard was my grandmother. The oldest daughter was, Elizabeth, was Ruth. She was born in 1900, and Elizabeth was born in 1903. And that was the only two children at the time that they came. Then they had two more boys at some point. Um, I'm not sure what years they were born. Flossie was born in 1909. She lived to be 102. And my father was born in 1912, and he was 94. He passed away. Um, anyway, my grandfather that had been told he would only had six months to live, lived to be 89 years old. And he loved, loved the country. He tried several different things. They, at one time, had, in all of this I've found, 
planted over 800 locust trees. Why? I don't know. He also had a large orchard he tried. Out of the orchard, we do have one mulberry tree left that was planted in about 1905 to 1908. We're not sure on that. Um, and it does put on some mulberries, and it's out in the horse pasture, and the horses love them. <laughs> but um, they did cantaloupe watermelon one year they raised a lot of those and he would get up early in the morning and pick them and take them to town to sell them and everything but he just didn't make enough money at it and I'm not sure what year it was but he read about hard red winter wheat in the Dover's telegram and that was out of Kansas and he ordered in some wheat and planted it had a good crop Divided it among his, his neighbors, came and helped him harvest it. Divided it among the neighbors. And my father was told that Granddad is the first one on record to have had wheat in this area. And at one time, Texas County was the largest producing wheat county in the state of Oklahoma. So it's kind of an honor. Mm -hmm. uh, Granddad did try also, before that, he tried planting cotton. He had been here and he thought, okay, this is beautiful. And when he brought Grandma back, he also brought his cotton scales back from Tennessee. Had the most beautiful cotton crop he had ever seen until the tumbleweeds turned loose and picked all his cotton and blew it away. So that's when he decided to try the horn. Um, that was 1905, and then through the 1920s, everything was going on pretty well. In 1922, he did build a a home and uh, they uh, let me back up a little bit he had purchased the land north of the southeast quarter that he homesteaded on he had purchased the northeast quarter of 414 and for ten dollars an acre in the late uh, probably 1918 in, in that area and but he had there was a half acre on the north end of that that uh, there wasn't any church out here there were several long ways from the church or schools and so they decided they put a church school combination in and grandpa let him use that land to put that, it was called the Eula School, and it only went to the eighth grade. Well, he wanted his children to have high school education, so he bought a home in town also, and Grandma and the kids during the school time would live in town. Grandpa would go in on Friday, pick them up, bring them back for the weekend, then take them back if the weather was permitting. Out of all the years that Daddy had 12 years of school, he only got to attend Eula School one year because he had sisters in high school all the rest of the time. So he only got to attend. It was one room schoolhouse, approximately 60 students, one teacher. A lot of times during the years, the teachers lived with my grandparents. Many times weather would get bad, they'd end up with a whole house full of kids because they couldn't get home. <laughs> but um, anyway, the Eula School, I think it was 1940, I'm trying to go back, 47, I believe it was, when the Eula School disbanded. And then we all went, everybody went to the Strait, which is uh, northeast of here, about seven miles straight school that was built. Um, that building then was moved and uh, Grandpa took back over the land. We have a neighbor boy that loves to do, uh, has a metal detector and goes metal detecting. He found a token from 1912 up there, World's Fair, on that site. And so we're sure some way somebody had been to the World's Fair and lost that token. 
Um, moving forward, things went pretty well for them in the farming until the drought got so bad in the late 20s and the early 30s. My father had helped Grandpa here with the farming and he and, and my mother, Mildred Baker, met in 1935 and she was working at the court clerk's office and Daddy had met her and he decided she had a job and he didn't so he'd marry her but anyway they got married and moved out here and were going to live with Grandpa and Grandma and right after they married he was offered a position at Huff which is three and a half miles northwest of us to have a Champlin filling station and he jumped on that his first check for a month was like six dollars and thirty five cents they had rented a house up there it was ten dollars a month for the rent and plus they had a grocery bill so he didn't know how that was going to work the next month though his commission check was six hundred dollars his commission was half a cent a gallon on gas, one penny a gallon on kerosene, five cents a gallon on motor oil. The price to customers, gasoline was six and a half cents a gallon, kerosene was four cents, motor oil was 35 cents a gallon. Um, in it was in 1928 actually then that my grandfather bought some land across the road. And he borrowed 2000 from the state against that. And he had a note at the bank for $6,000. And the crash came in 1929. 1931, the bottom fell out. And he didn't know what he was going to do. They kept hanging on. And Daddy finally after he got the job at Huff, Mr. Gear, the president of the bank, agreed to extend the note for one more year if Daddy would co-sign. And so my father co-signed the note, and really they hit pretty good working on the farm, had a good year, had good moisture, and made $12,000 on their wheat. And so they were able to pay off all their notes. My father never, ever, ever had a loan for anything else. If he couldn't buy it, pay cash, you didn't get it. That was his experience from what he had gone through with Granddad. Um, anyway, he stayed with the Champlain Station working, I'm not sure, into the 40s but I'm not sure when, and, and then farming too. In uh, 1938, I had, my oldest sister was born, they lived at Huff in 1940, and then I was born in 47. We all lived in Huff. Um, 1951, I think it was 1945, my grandmother passed away. 1951, Daddy was in the process of building this house now, for them to move down on the farm and just as the basement had been dug, well, my granddad passed away. Um, we moved down December 51. So I was four and was raised here and then uh, after I left home, I lived in Guyman. So Guyman's as far away from here as I've ever lived. Huff was as far away from here as my father had ever lived. He was born in the dugout, and neighbor lady had delivered him, and it's just the way it was. It didn't move. <laughs> my other sisters, one of them lives in, my oldest sister lives in Amarillo, and the other one lives in Lebanon, Missouri, but uh, this is still home. Let's see. Uh, so you didn't know your, grand, your grandparents? I, kn I can remember Grandpa. While they were working on the house here, I stayed over there with Grandpa, and I cannot remember, I should have asked my older sisters, 
what the lady's name was that came and stayed with him. But I can remember being there, and of course then you ate lots of beans, but you had to sort the beans. You didn't just open up a package and rinse them off and cook them like we do now. I can remember setting up on the, she'd set me up on the cabinet and have me help her sort the beans. But Grandpa would be playing the piano, and that was right before he died. He played by ear, and he'd play the piano and sang. He had a beautiful voice. And I, I can remember that some, but other than that, I don't a lot. My, I'd asked my sisters about Grandma, and really, and they said they don't have a lot of memories of her. She was a very quiet person, I, th I assume, the way they talked. Grandpa was more outgoing. Grandpa was um, on the church board. He was on the school board. He was also what they called, I can't remember what they called it. Sledgeville was the voting community and he was the head of the bill. He would go out and holler at seven o'clock in the morning that the voting's open and then at whatever time at night he'd go out and holler it's closed. And he did all the counting of the votes and the whole bit. He did that for several years. And that was over close to where the Muller place is. That's where the Sledgeville was. Um, and they raised primarily wheat during the whole time? Well, after, wheat, after the cotton? Wheat and maize. Maize, okay. Or Milo. No cattle. But Grandpa always called it maize. They didn't get into cattle. Um, I can remember we had some cows, and but just enough to where you had some milk and that you would butcher once a year. Chickens, Grandma was big on chickens. I have her 1936 diary, and in this diary, I don't care what was going on, she told how many eggs she got. Uh, what is today? August the... Sixth. Uh oh, August sixth. She actually didn't write anything. On August the seventh, Elizabeth did a big washing today. She washed quilts and blankets. August the eighth, they had gone to Huff, and I got two eggs. <laughs> um, just most days, she would write down like two eggs. Cutting wheat this or cutting weeds this morning. She was real good about putting down everything that was going on. Elizabeth was daughter. Elizabeth was daughter. Yeah, she was the oldest daughter. Um, Grandma did lots of canning. They said she winter time they never really had to buy much of anything, flour at the store, that type of things. She always had eggs, of course, with her chickens, and they had the milk, and they had the meat. And I don't, evidently they, like, cured the beef. I'm not sure how they processed the beef at that point. But, and then summertime they had full gardens and everything, so Daddy said, had told me, said they hardly ever had any grocery bill to speak of when he was a child. When Grandma and the girls would go to town to live, well, she'd take all of the canned stuff with them, and that's what, uh, they lived about two blocks from the school, and the kids go home at noon every day and eat. I would assume they'd go back and forth by horse and buggy? Yes, they did. Or wagon. Wagon. I'm not sure what year Grandpa got his first car. I don't remember. Uh, we. Their first tractor they got in 1925. Um, anyway, uh, after my granddad died, I honestly don't know if the land had been turned over into my father's name before. I haven't looked back at the deeds to see at what point it was it became his. Uh, I know he purchased some after grandfather died. And then in 1974, my husband started working for daddy. Um, 
I think it was in 68 maybe that he put in irrigation. Of course, it was flood irrigation. And it was on what we're on a correction line, so we don't have the full number of acres that a lot of people have. <laughs> Approximately 600 acres that he flood had flood irrigation for. Um, in 74, my husband started working for him. In 83, mom and daddy wanted to start doing a lot of traveling. And so they retired and Jack and I leased the place. And I, at that, I had been working in a, a CPA offices since 1967. I wasn't a CPA, but I was key punch and all of that good stuff, record keeping. And right. in 1983 then, when he, we leased the farm, I quit that, and I became the combine driver, and Jack and Daddy were trucks and grain cart and all of that. Daddy still wanted to be a part of it, but he didn't want the whole thing on his shoulders. And uh, I don't know what year it was that Daddy really had to quit, Then he got to where he, he could hardly see at all. His sight was very bad. He, we had to take his driving privileges away from him. That was hard. And uh, my mother passed away in 2001. And then Daddy was able to stay at home. We found had a lady that was coming and helping with them. And he passed away in 2007, about Three months before he passed away, we had to put him in a nursing home because mm -hmm. he'd gotten to be too much for her to handle, especially this far from town. Right. Well, when they, when your parents were running the farm, it was wheat still? Yes. And maize? Or Daddy did wheat and milo. Mm -hmm. um, and you lived here too at that time? No. No, after? My husband and I lived in Guyman. Okay. We did not move out here until after Daddy passed away in 2007. But you grew up here? I grew up here. And did you have chores? Oh yes. Um, there again, we always had chickens when I was a kid. and The chickens was the, our, the main chores for us girls. We helped in the garden. We loved going out and pulling weeds. used to be fun. It's not now. But, the, and, and picking and canning and uh, we were busy all the time. We we did have a lot of fun too. I mean, their philosophy was you get up, you get your work done, and when it's done, you played. Of course, we did get TV. I don't know in the 50s sometime, but we had like one or two stations, and the reception wasn't very good, and. Uh, we didn't watch a lot of TV. Well, what would you do for fun then? Well, if you could play, what would what Well, we had, um, we played in the summertime, we played croquet all the time out in the yard. <laughs> Set up croquet and play that. Uh, rode bicycles. There were neighbors around with kids and set, we'd set up swimming pools and we'd swim. I've got a basketball hoop back out in the round top and we play basketball. Mm -hmm. Downstairs we have a recreation room that Daddy was insistent on having a room for the kids to have fun in. They were youth leaders at the church and we had lots of parties over here. Have shuffleboard, we have ping pong. We played lots of cards, lots of dominoes, lots of board games. You just, and if you wasn't playing, I mean to us, Playing and having fun was like baking cookies, you know. That it didn't have to be that you went out and did anything. It was just something you liked to do. Yeah. My mother was uh, a sewer. She could make anything. She made nearly all of her clothes, and they were beautiful. And then she got into quilting, and uh, she made a lot of quilts. 
when she was in her 50s, she started taking painting lessons. I'd never known she had any artistic ability to her other than her sewing. Daddy bought woodworking machine. And he, well, when I was in the eighth grade, so that would have been 1960, he made a desk that I've got. That was his first piece of furniture. We've got a baby cradle that he made in 1965. It's beautiful. Won first place in the fair with that. And then nearly every frame that you see in this house and most of the pictures that are painted, my mother painted, my dad made the frames. They just, and uh, quilt racks, all of, all of the kids have quilt racks. And grandkids, and great grandkids. Well, and grand, and great grandkids, great. yeah, grandkids, and quilts. She made quilts. Jackie was small when, or my daughter was small when Mama was quilting. And there's, what's the one with the little girl's name with the bonnet? Sunbonnet Sue. Is it Sunbonnet Sue? Yeah, Sunbonnet Sue, I think it was. Is her but that actually wasn't my quilt. Oh, really? She made me the double wedding ring, and I was so small that I requested the Sunbonnet Sue. So <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be my older cousin's. <laughs> Anyway, all, all of the granddaughters had quilts. She, a lot of her great-grandchildren, she was still alive and, and cro she crocheted, made things. She didn't go buy a wedding gift for anybody or a baby gift for anybody. It was something you made some way. Did she pass that on to you? Do you so? Not to that extent. I've got lax in that. I did several of my nieces and nephews do cross stitch things for them. Quilting, I, I never got. I tried and tried to crochet. I couldn't get it. Mama's mother was left handed, and so she told me, she said, I can teach you to crochet because I can sit across the table from you, and what I'm doing with my left hand, you'll be doing with your right hand, and you'll catch it. I didn't. I, it just didn't work for me. But. Uh, a lot of that, you know, liking to have things more personalized mm -hmm. than just buying in a store. Well, were you involved with 4-H then? No, we weren't. Um, none of my sisters were. Straight school did not have 4-H, and I'm not even sure at Diamond at that point. I never did really know about it. Now, Mama was big in the Extension Club. She, for years and years, she was in the extension, and they had a big extension club out here. You remember the name? What were they were called? Uh, the Willing Workers. Mm -hmm. The Willing Workers Extension Club. And we've got several pictures of all the ladies, and I mean, there were 20, 25 of them. Mm -hmm. When they went to their club day, they dressed up to the hilt, big time. I mean, that was the day, or the day before, that they'd fix their hair and that they'd get up and wear their high heels and pull <laughs> bit. But the the women really enjoyed getting together, and that's something really that I miss. Now, <clears throat> our communities used to be much tighter as far as relationships with neighbors and the children and the schools and everything. Uh, people would get together. I, you know, we'd have box suppers. We'd do fun things. Just, just for no particular reason, you'd just do it, and everybody get together and have fun. And and uh, like the ladies' group, that they were so close. And we don't seem to. Have, I guess we're too busy now. I don't know. But they did everything. They did a lot more than. We do. I mean, with all the canning and and the washing and ironing, and they didn't have the clothes you could hang up and let them dry, and they looked good to put on, you know. They did it all. But uh, do you do you have any idea when electricity came to the farm? Roughly, <laughs> I don't. About electricity, Jack. Do you know anything about when they may have got electricity out here? I don't, I don't Probably have... Probably 30s, 40s. 
I'm guessing in the 30s. I know my parents at Huff, they were renting a little house and a lot became available to buy and Daddy bought it and bought what they called a bungalow and moved in. And that was in 1941, I think it was. And my oldest sister was three, and my other sister was a year old. Well, a couple of years later, someone moved in down there at the house where they had first lived that had children, and my sister, oldest sister, went down there to play, and she came home, she said, they've got, the, that's the neatest place to go, and she said, what? Mama said, why? And she said, because you don't have to go in the house to use the bathroom. They had the outhouse. Mama was so excited because they didn't have the outhouse anymore. Barbara thought that was the thing that everybody needed. But so I'm thinking that I've had electricity in the late thirties. So I don't really know when they got electricity down here. Well, when they would take their product to market, would was the closest place, Gaiman. Yes, Gaiman was the closest. And when Grandpa, when they first moved here, he hauled all their water from uh, the river that you went across when you came out here from Gaiman, but there's no water in it. Uh, and I'm not sure, I think it was two or three years before they, or a couple of years before they drilled the well. And they, uh, I know the well is in the, I think we can see the well in the picture. Did they have a windmill? The windmill. That time, mm -hmm. too. That uh, he didn't have to haul the water anymore. Um, and you were born in 47? I was born in 47. Right after the war, do you have any, did any of the members of the family have to go to war? Do Daddy you? didn't have to go to war because he was primarily involved in the farming. Okay. And at that point, at least one son in every family would be exempt if, the, if they were his family farm. And so Daddy did not serve. Um, and was the time in the 20s the only time the farm was at, at, at risk of being lost? Well, and, and the, up into the 30s, mm -hmm. see. Uh, it was after Daddy in the 30, like 36, 37, when the bank extended the note okay. because of his job with the oil company. Well, then fast forward a little bit in the 80s when there were farm issues all across Oklahoma. Where was there a challenge in here? We've had a lot of challenges. Um, our main challenge now is our irrigation water is diminishing. We drilled a new well about a year and a half ago, and supposedly it was supposed to be a 500-gallon well. It's maybe a 100, 150-gallon well. We had to tie two irrigation wells together in order to try to do the, we now have uh, center pivots, and we'll run pretty good for four or five days, and then the water belt starts going down. And, you don't have much pressure. We've re-nozzled, gone to different pressure nozzles and everything, and still don't do good. Um, we're not sure if it is the water level or if it was who drilled our well. Because we had some issues with when the well was drilled with some of the procedures that he did. Um, but there are a lot in this area that are starting to see a change in the water. And the drought hasn't helped. And the drought has not helped. The rain so far the last two or three months has been wonderful. We are at this point, I think 11.1 .1 inches here at the farm. I've got calendars back for probably 40 years. My dad wrote down every day how much it rained on these little calendars. And so I have continued that on but we've got the whole box of big calendars downstairs. And I need to go back someday and pull out some of the older ones and see 
I think last year was actually worse than any year that it had ever been. It was, we ended up the year less than, or right around 10 inches for the year. This year we have had a little over 11 inches at this point, which isn't a lot, but it's compared to last year. And you primarily still do wheat? Wheat and milo. And, milo. Mm -hmm. and how many acres do you farm? Well, we actually, of the original, homestead we have this half section here would be approximately 300 acres of farming ground when you take out the house but then we have some other land that we've purchased uh, besides what was in the original farm I think our total acreage now is around 700 acres but a lot of that we put into CRP and some of it's just pasture some of it's just for hay ground. Do no-till? No. Is it no-till? No-till? No. No. We, uh, we didn't, didn't transform over to the newer technologies because of our age. Yes. Okay. In fact, we sold our 1983 combine last year actually to Panhandle State University. They were tickled to death to have it because it had a little bitty platform and they had these test plots. And so... <laughs> They have the little platform, but it was getting to a point that if we had a breakdown in order to find parts for it, it cost us as, about as much as to hire someone to custom cut it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no more. Actually, the farming acres were down to 200 acres that we actually farm. And now did, my did my, you, go ahead. my sisters both inherited part of the land from my father and they've leased it out then, so. So since you and your husband have had it, has it been, has he worked off the farm too or is his primary time spent no. on the farm? His primary time spent on the farm. I, uh, <clears throat> I was from 1983 to 88 or 89, I did not work and then H&R Block one of my friends said, was down there, my neighbor, and she talked me into coming to work for her. And I worked then at H&R Block for 19 years, and then I've worked for CPAs since then, just tax season. And so that's... A little supplemental in income. Except this last year, I think I only worked a total of three weeks. <laughs> so I'm trying to get out of it. Well, has he had to have hired help to help him? Yeah. We haven't had, no, uh, part-time, like in the summers, one summer, my uh, niece's son, which would have been a fifth generation, he worked for us, he came, he lived in Amarillo and he stayed with us in Gaiman, but he came and worked for us, I think, Ty was 15. Mm -hmm. And then we've had other boys that helped in the summertime, we still have, I mean, if you look around the place all this morning, we had a couple of neighbor boys come over and they helped us out. Um, but as far as the farming, farming, it's mostly been Jack and I. And your daughters? Or? Yeah, she got to help some. What have you done over the years here? <laughs> all of it, at yeah. some point. Just in the summers, in not the summer. consistently, just when there was one other thing that needed done and something else needed done and I got stuck on the tractor <laughs> for the day. <laughs> and, yeah. and pipe. That was my yeah, moving job. pipe. When we had all the flood irrigation, that was the pits. I started driving probably when I was eight or nine. I'd drive the pickup when they picked up pipe. And then when I got big enough to pick up pipe, we switched off. I would I'd pick up pipe for a little bit, she'd pick up pipe for a little bit and we'd switch off driving. But, yeah. We had pretty good workouts. <laughs> you didn't have to worry about going to aerobics. Because <laughs> there were one, two, three, four, five, five different fields that were flooded. Four. Oh, four. Yeah. yeah. Four fields. Flood irrigation. I'm not sure what that is. You want to explain this? Well, somewhere. you, you have, instead of having a center pivot where a sprinkler goes around, mm -hmm. We've still got some pipe out here if you want to go look at it. <laughs> you had um, furrows 
that went straight down the field and you laid pipe up across the top of it mm -hmm. that had little gates that you opened. And every day you had to open and close gates because only it, your water would only fill so many gates to flood down. And so not only laying out the pipe, but then every day Jack really, oh, he did not like it. You had to go and bend clear over to the ground to open and close these gates to let the water out. Man manually. Open. It was manual, yes, all manual. And then keep record of it all. I mean, every day yeah. you had to write down what what you'd watered and what you shut off and what you started on and yeah. doing a whole field 10 foot at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of how you watered a field by flood. Mm -hmm. And they kept those records by hand. That was mm -hmm. oh, yes. prior to computers. Mm -hmm. You know, I still keep a lot of records by hand. Um, I do our, our books on QuickBooks. But as far as like for insurance purposes, for the crop insurance, where you still are supposed to keep track how much you water, when you put down fertilizer, what you put down, all of that. I, I just write it down. He turns on the sprinkler. I wrote down sprinkler on what time of day and then sprinkler off what time of day. And, and then you can figure out by the days it's run and what the settings are, how many inches of water has been applied. But I'm sure I, there's probably programs I could go in and do it on. But Has crop insurance been helpful through the years? Uh, yes and no. It has been. Um, we had one crop year before last that we short rated, though. And we ended up having to pay the full premium and we got nothing out of it. And it, it was a total loss. But yes, we've, the last two years, three years, really, crop insurance. Um, the government programs, the disaster programs they had uh, three years ago, I don't know if there will be any going on. I think that only paid up to the year 2011, maybe. I don't know if there will be anything, any assistance for 12 and 13 or not. But so I, my assumption was that was 12 and 13 were under the old farm bill, so there still may be some government assistance coming in on those two years. There was very little harvesting done in this area up until this this year. Now our, we didn't harvest wheat crop this year because of freeze. They assessed our circle, irrigated circle at 1.4 bushel. So we didn't harvest. But um, we had some neighbors that, that did good on the wheat this year and that was about the first good crop they'd had in three or four years. So hopefully things are turning around going the right direction. You kind of have to plan ahead based on what's happened. Well, and what's hard is is knowing with the changes in the last two or three years, especially with the government programs, we don't have a clue really what might be out there. I mean, except under the CRP, if we have anything in CRP, we know for how many years that's locked in. But as far as any of these other government programs helping out with the crops, you don't have anything, which 10 years ago, when you went in and figured out your estimate for the next year, like you always have to give to the bank, you knew in October we're going to get X number of dollars and in March we're going to get X number of dollars. You knew it because that was with the FSA papers that we'd signed. Now you have no idea. How do you keep up with all the different government programs? Um, honestly, we don't. You think you understand it? They, and since this new one has been implemented, we have had no meetings, public meetings, to explain them. Used to be, every time there was a change, you'd get a letter, we're going to have a meeting such and such night, you know, and we'll explain it. Evidently, FSA is not paying for them to do that anymore. 
you don't receive anything in the mail anymore. I, it's, you get it on the internet. And for that, for us, at this point, that's okay. Something happens to me, my husband doesn't even know how to turn on the computer and he's not gonna learn. <laughs> and honestly, probably 90% of the farmers in this area are that way. So, you know, they're trying to cut back money here and there, but at the same time, you don't know. And you go in to, to the offices and we have some very patient people at our office about trying to explain. They really don't know, can't answer a lot of the questions that people have. So, it's all pretty well up in the air. Are most of your neighbors your similar age, similar age as you? Um, we're, I think, the oldest ones in the community at this point. Mm -hmm. Then, half a mile south, the neighbor down there, he grew up there. And Carol's, I think, five years younger than I am. And we've got pictures of us playing in the yard when we were little kids. And, you know, um, yeah, we're the, we're the oldest, two miles west. Uh, the family that's there, the oldest one, I think is about five years younger than I am. Those are the only two that are still They're, in their parents' home, where right. they would have homestead. Everybody else is sold out. Yeah, everybody else around, it's all new families that have come in. A lot of the places have sold two or three times. Now the house about a mile and a half east here that you came by, the two-story house, that house sold out of that family about six years ago, I believe it was. Was Misty out here before we moved out here or after? Right at the same time. So it's, it's been about six years. That was the Dixon family. and. Uh, in fact, the lady that lived there, she delivered my father. She was kind of the nurse for the whole community. <laughs> but uh, that home hasn't sold several times, just the one time. So what's kept you here? What's kept us here? Yeah. Well, I guess the opportunity we had to Going. My husband, when we married, he was a cowboy. And he wasn't ever going to get on a tractor. <laughs> and he worked in feed yards, and, and uh, in fact, he was manager of feed yard for a while. But Daddy approached him about coming to work for him, and he wasn't sure about it. And for a while, when he was working with Daddy in the winter, he did some cowboy work still. but checking cattle for people and pastures and stuff, but he kind of got away from it and then got in farming. It never was his favorite thing, but it was something that he felt like was going to make a living for his family. At this point, I'm not, if, if the situation would have been what it is now with farming, I don't think we would have done it. Well, what do you see for the next 100 years? I don't know. <laughs> what do you what see do you for the next 100 years? What do you hope <laughs> for the next? <laughs> That's their decision to make, not mine. Okay, but when it becomes your decision to make, what, what decision are you going to make? I don't know. That's, That's their decision to make. Well, you're going to have to be 102, so you've got time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You know, that's, that's one thing, though, you think about it. All the things that we need to do out here and would like to do out here, then you get our age, do you really go ahead and put forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in a place when you might not be here but another 10 years, or what do you do? Tough decisions, yes. But anyway, we, I, I definitely would love to see this stay in the family in some way. I don't know if that's something that Jackie's going to be able to do or want to do. I've got a cousin that has children and grandchildren that some of them might at some point come in to. So you only have the one child? Yes. Okay. So I'm the one grandchild. Spot then. Yes. So. <laughs> right. 
but I think she's got lots of good memories from out here though when she was youngster too. Oh, what's your favorite memory of the farm as a child and, and now? Oh my. My dad and I were so close. Daddy, the, the doctor had always, before I was born and told him, yeah, he was sure this one was going to be a boy and it wasn't, so Daddy always <laughs> raised me as his son. But uh, I'm not saying my sisters didn't help, but they didn't seem to really have the desire to be out working with him that I did. And I just all the time spent with him. I was four years old and he had me driving the pickup while he was putting wire up on the fence post. And it was right north of the house here. He'd, lay, he'd had the post in the ground, he'd laid out the wire, and all he had to do was put it up and hook it on. And so he put me in the pickup, and it had this gear you could put it in, and it would go on its own. Compound. Compound. And he put it in compound and told me to go to the other end. Well, he got way ahead of me. And so I got, and I couldn't reach the foot pedal. So I get down on the floor and push on, on the foot pedal, and I went through his fence. <laughs> and he brought me to the house and was gonna spank me. <laughs> and Mama said, well, what do you expect giving a four-year-old to drive? <laughs> you know? But that, I said he was gonna spank me. One time, too, I remember, I'll never forget this, he was, Mama was really mad at me. And Daddy said, well, I'll spank her. Because he thought if she spanked me, that she'd probably spank me too hard. So he took me in the back of the bedroom. He told me to lay down on the bed. And I was scared to death because Daddy had never spanked me. And he said, now I'm gonna hit this bed and you're gonna holler. <laughs> And he hit the bed, and I hollered, and we went back out, and that was my spanking. <laughs> but, um, I don't know, and Mom at the times, I mean, with her just in the kitchen, and it was just, it was just all precious time. What was the favorite thing she cooked for you? Hmm. Cherry cheesecake. On what? Cherry cheesecake. Cherry cheesecake, yeah, she was really good at that. And fried chicken. And fried course. chicken, she could fry chicken. I never got, never did get it down like she could. Mm -hmm. And her mother was an excellent cook and Grandma Baker never had a recipe. There's not one written recipe of Grandma's. You just put a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a dab of this and she could bake cakes or make perfect pie crusts and breads and everything and she never never used recipe. Most of everybody else in the family for grandma was their her Italian her what was it, the Italian cake. What is it? it has a coconut in it. Yeah. I don't remember what it was called. Just a, that you get at the store. But all of the family loved that. I'm not a coconut fan, so the cherry cheesecake was my favorite. <laughs> Mom has, we're, my sisters and I are wanting to put together a cookbook with Mama's recipes. And it's going to get done someday. And then maybe some stories in it too. Some pictures of Daddy, Mom and Daddy together. Well, what were holidays like on, on the farm back in the earlier days? Well, we always, always had a live Christmas tree and uh, the house smelled really good because of that. <laughs> lots of bacon, lots of family. Bacon? Oh, bacon. 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 Lots of family. Um, well, by the time everybody had the kids, most holidays, every other year, it was either Thanksgiving or Christmas that everybody came in. Everybody came. Yeah. All three daughters, yeah. with all of their children, with all of their children, yeah. were required to be here. <laughs> so yeah, it was this table, sometimes a table in there, always tables in that room. Yeah. All We went all through the house, depending on, and by that point, there were 
Um, even when I was in high school, there were at least five great grandkids by that point. So, so yeah, it twenty was, some to thirty people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it was every every other year. It was either Thanksgiving or Christmas, and it wasn't necessarily here to open presents, um, but just here for a meal right around one of those two days. Thanksgiving you typically happened on Thanksgiving Day and Christmas, if it wasn't Christmas Day, which usually it was Christmas Day at noon, mm -hmm. it was the day after. Yeah. But on <clears throat> Christmas Eve, we'd always have to read the Christmas story from the Bible. Daddy, they were both real strong in the church. Um, when the Eula Church disbanded, over at Strait, they were putting in a gas plant, a city service gas plant. And school was built there, and they had actually determined they were going to disband the church, and there was a revival going on in Guyman. And the man said something to Daddy about, you know, how's your little church going? And Daddy told him what the situation was, and he said, I've heard about that they're building a gas plant out there. Straight, why don't you go over there and build a church? Well, the same year they built this house in '51, they built the church over there. In fact, my grand—it was before Grandpa died because he's one of the charter members, and we have a picture of him digging ground at the church. '51. We still attend there, um, but the straight camp has closed down because everything's gone electronic. Now they don't have the big gas plants they used to have. At one point in our church, we had, it was a Christian church, but we had every denomination there because of the camp, and especially in the youth department. There would be, oh, 15 to 20 high school, and that many in the junior high, and then the grades, and the church was full. Now we have an attendance of 12 to 20 people. Total? Yes. Mm -hmm. And some of the people have said we just need to shut it down, but you get to that point and then we have a large family come in that had, had some tragedies hit and they might not be there but every two or three weeks, but we're needed. They don't feel comfortable other places. They feel comfortable there. They're being served, but Mom and Daddy were both big on working in the church. Daddy served on the school board for I don't know how many years, too, at Strait. And uh, he was very instrumental in, in that school. About how far is that from here? About seven and a half miles. And Daddy did, he attended one semester at Oklahoma Payne House State University. That wasn't what it was called then, but it's where you he went one semester in May. It was PU then. He still threw the flag still here somewhere. Yeah. It was PU. Yeah. Penhound University. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. PU right. Aggies, I remember. He had a pennant. Yeah. Forever. I don't even remember reading that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he. Uh, um, my old, oldest sister didn't attend college. <coughs> My next sister, she did. She uh, attended uh, Phillips University at Enid and became a teacher. And I was in school over at Van Hill State a year and a half, and I was working for an accounting firm. And my employer was actually a professor at the college. He was the accounting professor at the college. And second semester, he called me into his office. I was just working part time. Can you please just go to work full time? Because the lady that had been doing the key that key punch, and I don't know if you know what a key punch is, key punch and all that, she would, had some medical problems and gonna have to quit. And you're gonna learn everything here that you learn over there. And he talked me into quitting, and he was supposed to sign me out over at the college. Well, I went and signed up for a class several years later and I had all of these <laughs> dropout <laughs> things on my record. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just had a year and a half college. Jackie did 
complete college. She went to Clarendon for junior college, and then she went to OSU. And what was your degree in? Ag communication. Mm -hmm. Still farm related then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my middle sister, I think all of her children graduated from college. So. She had three. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, well, two. Two her Direct, and one two, adult. yeah, and one stepchild. My oldest sister, none of hers. Graduated from college, I don't believe. They, some of them went. I don't know. Yeah, I think they went, but I don't believe they haven't graduated. But education from Grandpa on down was important. I mean, Grandpa wanted wanted his children uh, out of his all three of his daughter, all three of my father's sisters ended up being teachers. <clears throat> Flossie, the one that lived to be a hundred and two was a teacher, and uh, <clears throat> in 1935 she had a child, Frankie, and he had water on the brain, where the head gets real big. And by the time Frankie was five, he had to be in a wheelchair because he couldn't balance to walk. Mm -hmm. And they told him he might live to be 10 years old. Well, <clears throat> he got to the point, and well, Aunt Flossie had to quit teaching, so she basically homeschooled Frankie at home. He was very intelligent. He lived to be 50 years old. He had ended up having to have both legs amputated. She cared for him. Never a complaint. Nothing. I said, God just blessed you with all of this because of all the years that you spent with Frankie. Never a complaint. Never, poor me, nothing. And she raised other children and had a good family and they they never had much at all, but they never, ever were, were any way saying poor me or anything like that. Yeah. We've had a lot of really been blessed with a lot of really special people in our family, mm -hmm. put it that way. Sounds like it. Good. Well, to describe a typical day for us, a typical day on the farm today. Today? Yeah. Not, not with us, not us here, but if we weren't here, what would you be doing? It, it just depends on the day. Uh, Basically, what we've typically been doing since we moved here in 2007 is to try to refurbish a lot of things that had gone down and uh, go through and sort out things. We still have closets full and barns full of stuff that, and boxes that we don't have a clue what's in them. <laughs> so some days you get up and you hit that. Some days we're out working in the fields, and some days we're off to town, you know. That's a bad thing. When Jack and I lived in town, we were only two blocks from the grocery store, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got all kinds of groceries downstairs, and I can go to make something, and I'm out of one thing, you know. <laughs> but I'm not as organized as my mother was, let me put it that way. They made weekly trips to town on Friday. That yeah. was their weekly trip to town. Mom would get her hair fixed, and they'd go to the grocery store, and they'd do... Uh, there might be a part or something they'd have to go get another day, but that wasn't... You didn't go run around town. You went to town, and you got a part, and you came back here, or one mm -hmm. of them stayed here, one of them went to town, and... But there wasn't just go to town. <laughs> but now we go to town too often, probably. <laughs> That's, I give her... I tease her often of... I thought you were only supposed to make that trip weekly. <laughs> <laughs> and just, I mean, and it's not, it's 10 miles, but that was just, they went on Friday. Mm -hmm. That was town day. Well, that's, Mama was much more scheduled than I am. On, on Monday, she did laundry. On Tuesday, she ironed. On Wednesday, she usually cooked. On Thursday, she cleaned house. On Friday, they went to town. 
and then Saturday and Sunday was their free time. Sunday was church. And that's why you did it every week. I don't do that. <laughs> How would she do her laundry? Well, we had washer. I by that time. Most, she had a dryer she hardly ever used. I mean, in the wintertime she used it, mostly she hung her clothes out. I can remember hanging clothes. You yeah. Know, she still did that. Yeah. And I convinced my husband we still have one line up on our clothes line. But there's a lot of things that I really like to hang out, but he doesn't like to mow under the line. <laughs> well, what does he do on a typical day then? Uh, feeds horses and uh, goes through junk out in the barns. He still has wells. And yeah, we've got wells to, to tend to and decisions to make on crops that are failing or whatever. Are, are most of the fence, fences new or old? No, what fences are out here, we've got leased off pasture. And so that they just put those up. There's not, actually there's nothing here other than that mulberry tree from, from the past. We tore down a chicken house that had been built in the 40s about a year and a half ago. It, and it was just ready to fall down. And that was hard. I was glad the day that it did come down, we were gone. We had a neighbor man that said he'd take it down and haul it off. And I, it would have been hard to see it yeah. being torn down. But it was dangerous. The river walked, rotted, and there wasn't any way to go in and really fix it. So when you and your husband took over the farm, did you add any, add any buildings? No. Uh, now the, the red horse barn out here, Daddy and Jack built that. He's, he's outside the two. I thought it was 79. Yeah, about 79, I believe. He and Daddy built that. Now we've had it, uh, just siding put on it this year couple of months ago because the wood, wood was rotting out a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But they built that and Daddy wanted Jack to have a place to put his horses if he needed to. And so we built it and didn't have a horse in it for a long time. <laughs> had them out here for a while and then yeah. had them other places and now they're back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about the Quonset? The, the, the Quonset. That was built before the house. That was built and fit in the 50s, I believe, but the date's on it, out there in the cement. It's like the date, I believe, but it was in the 50s. They built the closet. Oh, it was 51. They've been 51 and this was 54? No, this was 51. Oh, then We moved in 40s? in December 51. So then it has to be the 40s, wouldn't it? I don't know, I think it was 50. I know my uncle, uh, my dad's oldest sister, Ruth, her husband, Melvin Short came in to help build, and Uncle Melvin slept in there most of the time when the weather was nice because he didn't want to intrude on the family. We lived at Huff, and Grandpa was having not doing having good nights and everything, and so Uncle Melvin slept out in the barn. <laughs> well, was there a particular reason they built the metal one versus a wood one? Probably because of the longevity. And he was very smart and put metal beams in it where some of the neighbors around actually had wood curved beams. And those are the barns that you're seeing that's doing this. We've, we've had very good luck. We had to replace the sliders on the doors. And that's the, really the only thing we've replaced. In that. Maybe the Skylights, I don't remember, but some of them. Been a long time. Not a continuous thing. But it's, I mean, it's. Been very Jack would love to have the overhead doors that, you know, electric that it push and open up. But then if you get anything too tall, you can't get them in there. So we haven't gone to that. But it's, yeah, that's. Daddy. And Daddy built. 
he didn't have this house built. He built this house. Now, that room in there they built on after. It was 1983. 83? Yeah, 83. And they built that room on. But the rest, this floor, I don't know if you'll notice the way it's laid. My dad laid this floor. And that was one thing when we moved out here. Mama had carpeted over the, this, and I wanted to see this floor again. I would have too. It, it was neat. And he taught himself, as yeah. far as you know? Uh, his, one of, Daddy, Daddy sang beautifully. One of Daddy's favorite songs was A Carpenter's Son was Jesus. And he always wanted to follow that line, not only being a follower of Christ, but live the lifestyle. And he, so he, he liked the carpet, the woodwork. Well, uh, he never attributed it to, but a lot of it, they talk about that room was built with a lot of wood that came out of an old barn that my great-grandfather had brought the wood from Tennessee, Missouri, where yeah. he was at the time. And they talked about the quality of wood that was used for the foundation of that room that was in that barn. And so I think yeah. some of his love of it probably came from his father. Yeah. And then he learned how to build what he could out of it. Well, and Grandpa but being in the lumber business. business. Yeah. And he, knew. He, he taught him what to look for. Mm -hmm. So he knew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they did a pretty amazing job on this. I mean, they had help. He had, had a guy came in, you know, helped lay the brick and helped do this or helped do that. But Daddy basically was him and Uncle Melvin. Basically did it. They were the contractors. Yeah, <laughs> designed it. Um, the kitchen mostly is all the same. They did add put up that brick on that north wall several years after we were here. But a lot of the wallpaper, I mean, it's been here forever. Mm -hmm. uh, the ceilings in there, I keep being told that's out of date, but <laughs> it's, you know. But it's home. Mm -hmm. It's home. Where did this table come from? This was Grandpa, this 1922. This was out of Grandpa's third, when they bought the house. He bought this table. 1922. 1922. Mm -hmm. We did put rollers on it. <laughs> Did we want to tell a little bit about the piano you were telling us earlier? Well, the piano also was 1922. And where is it? Huh? Where is it now? It, down in the, in the basement. I took them down and showed it to them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I say that, but no, they had that piano in the dugout. Mm -hmm. Because Aunt Flossie, the song that I started playing, I had a book that was her one of her piano books, and she got a gold star on that. And the name of it's Melody of Love, and that was written the years that she was born. That was written in 1908. I believe it was, Melody of Love. But they had that piano in the dugout, so I'm not sure what year it was. But the piano never leaves the house because you can't get it out. The, the wall, Daddy put the piano downstairs. Oh, and I didn't show you the deep freeze. We have a 1951 deep freeze down there that we're still using. <laughs> he put both of those down before he built the wall across the utility room, which is top the steps. No, I so I guess if the freezer goes out, I've got a good blanket box. <laughs> <you know? laughs> But uh, the piano, I don't know what we'll do. I guess if we ever, for any reason, have to leave here, we'll take the wall out of the utility room. I don't know. Is everyone buried at the same cemetery? Um, my grandparents and my parents, yes, they're at Guyman at the Elmhurst Cemetery. They're not in the same. Not in the same. We'll tell them about Grandpa and Grandma's plot. Why, why grandpa, why my grandpa and grandma are in that plot? Because all the babies. 
Well, they had lost the two sons, babies, that they had buried. And then they have their grandpa and grandma herds is there. And there's another grave in there. We don't know where it is, but a neighbor child had died and family didn't have any place. And so because of that, there wasn't room for mom and daddies to be in that. So um, I had a son that had passed away and when we bought his place, we bought for us what mom and daddy bought next to us. And so, but we're kind of on the south side of the cemetery and grandpa and grandma's on the north. And that was just something grandma would always talk about is the babies. They, yeah. And that's just how shall we refer to it have to put flowers out for the babies and have to, you know, there's not room for us because the babies are in there. The babies are in there. <laughs> it was just always kind of, they always remembered that there were other babies in that area of the cemetery. And then there's other over there that we don't have a, there's a possibly Bernie and a possibly somebody else and That's you put flowers says. on those. On Memorial Day or just? Yes. Nobody ever know, knew who they were but they needed to be remembered, so <laughs> always put flowers. We put, last year, we decorate at Hooker, where my mother's parents and family are, and at Guyman, and then my husband's got two cemeteries with family in them down by Durham, Oklahoma. And I think it was 42 graves last year that we decorated. But it takes a while. That's something that the, this current generation doesn't do too much of. Well, I don't know. We Guyman and Hooker cemeteries always do. end up looking pretty nice. Well, the ones at Durham do too. Mm -hmm. But it it takes a while, and and we kind of cheat and go back and pick up a lot of flowers and reuse them the next year. But sure. <laughs> with forty two, but guess. with that many. Yeah. It takes a while, but it's some, that was something that that my parents were really adamant about, and didn't want it lost. And we're the only one of the really close family that's still here that does anything like that. So, just something we do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think a lot of of Daddy's courage and ours too has has come down from Grandpa and his. I can't imagine being forty one years old and moving to a whole different place mm -hmm. and going into a whole new occupation and not knowing what was going to happen. You know, he had he had a lot of trust in God, and and he was just willing to pour his life into whatever he needed to do to make things happen. And Daddy was always that way. And he just, it's just something he passed on that it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you're going to get through it, and it's going to be better. And you know, just blessed to have that legacy. I don't know. Do you think of anything else? I mean, that's a very good note to end on if there's nothing <laughs> else. Um, I don't know. I feel blessed when so many people don't seem to know anything. And we haven't really got into the genealogy, genealogy part of it real heavy. Mm -hmm. We are having a herd reunion in uh, September in Arkansas and some of my cousins or second and third cousins have done a lot of the genealogy search. So we do know um, when Grandpa came out here some of the herds cut him off pretty much because he was leaving. Mm -hmm. And it was several years before then they kind of reunited on any relationships, but I guess one of his brothers was really mad because they thought he was 
leaving their mom and dad so he didn't have to take care of them. Didn't want to have to help with them. And so it, it took a while to get past some of that type of stuff. But Grandpa, he stuck with it. Uh, my grandmother was a Reed. She had a brother named Sam Reed. Sam Reed was an engineer for Casey Jones. It's got some pictures of Sam with a train, and I'm not sure Casey Jones may be in the picture. I don't know. <laughs> but we, we haven't researched a lot of that on genealogy either. Yeah, but you know your roots here, though. Yeah. I think you said when we first got here, you got married in this house? Yes, Jack and I got married in the living room in front of the fireplace in 1970. So, a lot of good memories. Never thought about us really moving out here when that happened, but that's what we did. It's been, it's fun. I, I dug out all of this stuff and not knowing what you would want and everything, but then going back through it reminds you. Yes. And I really probably ought to pick up the hobby of scrapbooking so I can figure out how to put it all together in a book <laughs> instead of having it just marked like this. But you have some very nice things, especially the diary. Yeah, and let my cousin sent a thing too. She had another. They had sorted out Grandma's diaries years ago. And oh, where's the, what was there? Robert had sent that different things, and she'd written down everything that Grandpa was doing and in the fields. And I mean, like it was snowing, and he was out with his horses, and he was plowing, even though it was snowing, because he needed to get the ground ready. And uh, it was just me. Perseverance. <laughs> Yeah. All right, then we'll, we'll, we will close out and thank you very much for sharing. Well, thank it's you. It's been a pleasure.